97 of your service folder, I believe, if you'd like to follow along. <clears throat> Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Dear brothers and sisters who are in Christ, debuts can be stressful. Right? First-time performances are filled with angst and anxiety and stress and worry. And for that very reason, it's not all that surprising when debut performances don't go all that well. Right? If you don't believe me, think about it this way. We're going to go to the world of professional football. You know the name Terry Bradshaw? It's a household name. You see him in commercials everywhere, right? One of the all-time greats, Hall of Fame quarterback, four-time Super Bowl champ. His first game in the NFL, lackluster at best. Four completions, 14 incompletions. Big name, all the hype around him coming out of college. Didn't do anything earth-shattering in his debut. Ever heard of the name Troy Aikman, another multi-Super Bowl time winner? His first game was a little bit better. He had seven completions, but his debut season was one of the worst of all times. Lost all 11 of the games that he started in. The opposite of an undefeated season, he was only defeated. You ever heard the name Peyton Manning before? Right, a household name nowadays. His very first season, debut season, he led the NFL in interceptions. 28 of them. Debut performances can go terribly wrong. And it shouldn't surprise us, right? I mean, think about it. Put your shoes in the shoes of an NFL and the cleats of an NFL quarterback. Imagine sitting in that tunnel, going out for your first game. The pros are not college, right? You look at these linemen, they look more like grizzly bears running at you with breakout speed, trying to take your head off. Millions of dollars on the line. Legacies and dynasties. Names to be remembered. All of that pressure on you as the professional quarterback. I don't see any Hall of Fame quarterbacks in the room, unless I'm sadly mistaken. But many of you have felt similar pressure to that, haven't you? When rubber hits the road, when it's go time, when your debut is right in front of your face, for the nurse that spent years of study, looking at anatomy and physiology books and general health and practices and, and biology books. And then all of a sudden they open their eyes and there's a body, not a mannequin, not a fake, being rolled in on the hospital bed, right out of the ambulance. All eyes are on you. All of a sudden you hear that heartbeat monitor and it, it sounds like it's beeping only at you. Life's at stake and all eyes are looking at you. Or, or you have the lawyer who's been looking at textbook after textbook after textbook, studying and practicing every hypothetical under the sun. And the next thing you know, you open your eyes and look up, and there's a judge with a robe in front of you. And your client is seated next to you. And their life is in your hands, and you have to watch every single word you say, one misstep, and the trial is gone. Those of you that are parents, many of you spent years praying to the Lord, please provide for me a child. I would love more than anything else on planet Earth to be a parent. And the next thing you know, you hear their first cries. And the nurse looks to you and says, the diaper is not going to change itself. That child is depending on you very early on in life to literally keep them alive, to provide for them, to sustain them. Your debut performance is here. Many times over, debut performances don't go according to plan. But the debut performance in our gospel is all according to Jesus' plan. We can imagine there was so much stress and anxiety in the air, but can you imagine the excitement for these young disciples? Everything was about to change. Jesus' philosophy for ministry was about to take a drastic shift. We're about halfway through his ministry. For about a year and a half now, Jesus has been the teacher, the rabbi, that's been going out and preaching and teaching with authority this message that leaves synagogues in amazement. And all of his disciples, all the crowds, have been gathered at his feet 
to listen to what he has to say. He's shown and demonstrated absolute authority even over impure spirits. The demons, the powers of darkness themselves answer to him. He's healed and performed miracles that no one could explain. But that's going to change. In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus calls his disciples and sends them out. Jesus says to them, you're no longer going to be the student, but you're going to be the preacher. You're going to be my teacher. You're going to practice what I have preached. Enough sitting at my feet and use your feet to go out and take this message to others. And Jesus, we notice, doesn't use a booming microphone like they do in the NFL or NBA drafts, but he calls them personally with his still small voice. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. We see the twofold purpose of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, of seating, sitting at his feet at work here, right? You know why you listen to the word, to grow in it and to go with it. And that's what he does for his disciples here as he sends them out. And he does so with twofold comfort. He sends them with an associate. He sends them out, not alone, but two by two. And think of this as so much deeper than when you went on a field trip and your teacher called out because you had to be safe as you crossed the road, grab a pal, grab a buddy and hold their hand. This is something so much deeper than that. This is the intimacy that you and I have as brothers and sisters in Christ sent out together as associates of the gospel with authority. Notice the name that they are sent with. Notice the backing that they have, the authority of not their own names, but of Jesus Christ, their Savior. And what Jesus is saying in these words, you are going to preach to many. And you know who's even going to have to listen to you? The impure spirits, the powers of darkness will not be able to defy you because you represent me. Jesus calls them in and huddles them up and gives them this information and just as he's about to send them out, he continues to give them these cues, this checklist of what they're about to do. And as he does that, he tells them what they are to bring. And it's astonishing to us. At first, we imagine the disciples saying, really, Jesus? Is that a joke? What are we actually going to bring? This is a big time journey. There's a lot riding on this. What do you actually want us to pack up? Nope. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. What do you pack for a journey? What do you pack for a trip? Depends, right? Laura's come to know me, and even my family has come to know that I'm not a fun person to vacation with because I leave the house to go on vacation about five or six times. I get in the car, I pull out of the driveway, I close the garage door, and then I hesitate. I had to have forgotten something, so I go back in the house and I walk around every single room and see if I left anything behind. Nope, we're all good. And then I leave. And I get halfway down the, the street and I realize, ooh, that would have been nice to have that charger from the nightstand or, or I should bring a second uh, container of contact solution. So we go back. And then we leave and go a little bit further and, and then I'm hesitating again. The disciples had no reason to hesitate. This wasn't a long list that they had to remember. What are you to bring? We're really Nothing. Bring your staff and your sandals and that will be good enough. What do you pack for a journey? What do you pack for a trip? Well, it depends on the destination, right? If you load up a suitcase with swimsuits only to make your way north in the middle of December, that's a wasted money on a pack bag, wasted money on a check bag. If you head out west during the middle of July and you pack a full suitcase of wool, wool coats, that, too, is a waste of money. Depends on the destination, where you are heading and what you're doing. If you're going on a business trip, you're going to need your backpack or your briefcase with your laptop and your desktop and your materials and your textbooks and all these things to get work done and your mouse and your headset. If you're going to get away and to relax, you need to leave those things behind. Destination is important, but that's not the reason why Jesus called them to leave everything behind. Because it was all about the purpose of their trip. The purpose of their trip wasn't vacation. 
This wasn't rest and relaxation, time to catch some Z's and catch a breeze. This was time to go out and tell others about the things that they had heard, the miraculous nature of the gospel, the good news that had saved them. That is what it was all about. And as they did, the message that Jesus was going to share with them was this, that's going to be enough. I've given you the words and I'm going to take care of the rest. Imagine if this was a parent saying to their children, what are you supposed to bring on vacation? Nothing. The clothes on your back and the shoes on your feet will be good enough. And you can just hear the kids of today shooting back at mom and dad, really? I can't bring my AirPods? I can't even listen to any music? I can't bring my Yeezys or my flip-flops? How uncomfortable that's going to be. No potato chips, no trail mix, no snacks along the way. What, are we going to starve to death? But that's the entire point that Jesus is trying to make here. Everything that you are going to need, I will give to you. It's plastered over murals. It's posted all across the walls in our house. It's paraphrased and said in many ways throughout all of Scripture. You've heard it many times over. The simple yet profound statement, the Lord will provide. You've heard it before. You trust it to be true. How many times you've prayed that and said the Lord's Prayer, Lord, give me today my daily bread. Has there been days where you wonder if daily bread will be there? Think about it this way. When's the last time that you worried about money? When's the last time that you spent frantically thinking about your finances? Whether you're living paycheck to paycheck or you got money saved away, when's the last time that you sat down and you stressed out about the money that's going into your savings account, about the money that is plummeting in the stock market, about the things that you have to provide for yourself and your family? The reality is this the devil loves to use money to cast out. That little question that he puts inside of our ears and into our hearts will it be enough? Will the Lord sustain you? And that question he drives over and over again as we objectively look at the things that are around us and leaves bigger and brighter question marks in our minds. I don't know if the Lord's going to provide. And it's all a big fat lie. Because what the Lord has said will always be true. We don't have a God who just gives enough. We don't give a God who barely allows us to scrape by. The Lord has promised to provide, and He will do so. The Lord has promised a way out for our salvation, and He will take care of our every day. He's done it for many of you for decades. You haven't starved. You haven't gone many nights without a, a roof over your, cl- over your head and a, a comfy bed for you to sleep in or couch. You have multiple sets of clothing in the closet. You have a full pantry at home. You have options. Options to pick from when it comes to breakfast and lunch and dinner, and you and I worry about whether the Lord will provide? Who has given us those things? Only God. Everything that we have comes down from Him. He's proved it to be true day in and day out. Trust it and know it will be for all of your days. Take nothing with you. Trust in me that I will provide. And as Jesus wraps up his pep talk here, if what he's already said wasn't surprising enough, he goes on. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. If this is a rally the troops kind of speech that Jesus is giving, as he's ending his argument, you might be asking yourselves, are there any troops left? Doesn't Jesus know the art of public speaking? You know they say that the the most profound part of your speech should be the last 30 seconds because that's the only part that the majority of people will listen to? And this is how Jesus ends it? Well, Well, what message is he trying to get across? What's he trying to share? The truth. Many, many people are going to reject you. Many, many people are going to be anything but welcoming when you share this message of the good news of the gospel. Don't trust it to be true. Do you remember our gospel reading last week? Jesus himself, a prophet in his own town without honor, 
goes into Nazareth and they hear this beautiful message that he preaches. And yet what do they say? Isn't this just the carpenter's son? Isn't this Joseph and Mary's boy? Get him out of here. Who does he think he is? Well, the reality is this, that will happen for you in your hometown, the town you grew up, a town you're new to, or wherever you go. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you know the commission. You know the command that Christ has given you. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go out and preach the good news to all creation. So what's stopping you? And what's stopping me? Why don't we from sun up to sundown tell the story of salvation that is so true to us and gives us so much eternal peace? Why don't we share it and share it and share it and can't be stopped from sharing it? I think there's a number, number of reasons there, right? The threat of embarrassment, the threat of not knowing enough, anxiety and panic and worry set in. You just don't know the words to share, so you don't share anything at all. But I think above all else, the greatest threat to our outreach efforts and evangelism is this, the threat of rejection, the threat of being rejected. We absolutely hate the idea of it. Have you ever heard of the, the phrase before, social conformity or bandwagon effect? If you haven't, let me, exp let me illustrate it through a social experiment I once viewed. There was a woman who thought she was being called in to do an interview for an opening and a job, but it was really all a game. It was really all a social experiment all along. So she's called in. She gets dressed up. She goes in and, and sits in the office uh, entryway and sits down amongst all these empty chairs. And she looks up, and there's the secretary that she checked in with. And she sits down and waits. And as she's doing so, she hears a beep. The beep goes off out of nowhere. She doesn't think much of it. Five minutes later, beep goes off again. Every five minute, in five minute intervals, that beep keeps going off. And she noticed something. It meant nothing to her, but as more and more people made their way into that waiting room, there's about 20 people that now surrounded her waiting for what she thought would be that interview. And then something astonishing happened. The next time that the beep happened, all 20 of them that surrounded her stood up. She was confused. She didn't know why they were standing up. And they sat down. Five minutes later, beep, went off again, and they all stood up. She didn't know why. She had a look of confusion all over her face, and they sat down once more. It took her three, three beeps. The third beep, beep, she stood up alongside all of them. Five-minute intervals, beep, 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 every single time she stood up and sat down with the crowd. And the crowd started to get smaller as they were called into the interview or they called to leave the room. And it was just her at the end. And she kept standing up every five minutes because of the beep. Finally, the person that was leading this social experiment came into the room and let her know that there's not a job opening. There's no opportunity there. This is all just a social experiment. And he asked her, why did you stand up? Her answer, because everybody else was doing it. The reality is this, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are absolutely obsessed with acceptance. We want to be accepted. It, it changes, it drives our behavior because the last thing that we want is to be rejected. We hope and we pray that people love us, that they welcome us, and that we can just blend in. But the reality is this, Jesus has not called you to blend in. Jesus called has called you to stand out and to boldly proclaim the gospel, even if it means rejection. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the difficult question that your Savior asks you today. Can you handle rejection for my name? Can you possibly handle the rejection that might come from your own family? When I went to Omaha for pastor's conference earlier this week, there was a, a missionary that I was talking to that shared something with me that I, I really need to ponder more on a weekly basis. Never really thought about it deeply, but it's so true. This is the truth that he shared with me. He said, sadly, so many Christians think that they need to take a mission trip and travel to some third world country thousands of miles away, overseas, at mountaintops and in the deepest valleys 
to possibly find some mission opportunities. In the meantime, there are dozens of people in their own family that don't know Jesus. Now, I hope you realize that he's not against mission work overseas, and neither am I. That's not what that statement's saying. We love it. Any opportunity to converse with people about Jesus is a beautiful thing. But the reality is this. The mission field is right here. It's in your neck of the woods. It's at your dinner tables and in your cubicles at your office. It's in your immediate sphere of influence. So many people in your family that need to hear that gospel over and over again. At risk of what? At risk of being rejected. At risk that they might block your number. At risk that they might uninvite you to family gatherings from now on and not talk to you anymore. The reality is this, it is worth it, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to proclaim the name of our Redeemer and be rejected for it. The, the wisdom of this world will call you moronic. People will shake their heads at the foolishness of the gospel that you cling to at all costs. People won't believe what you believe. And day in and day out, people will reject you. And Jesus asks you, can you do that for me? Can you be rejected for me? And our answer is this, Lord, only through your strength. Only through the strength that was rejected first and foremost for us. Be reminded this day that no one knows rejection like Jesus. His rejection meant your salvation. He went to that cross and his very own father was disgusted with what he saw and couldn't stand the sight of the sin that was on his shoulders and had to turn his back and forsake him. The world that Jesus loves with an unconditional, unlimited love rejected him and put him to death on the cross in the most humiliating of fashions. His disciples that he had intimately been with for years cursed him, deceived him, and fled from him. Many times over, you and I have not claimed Christ as our own, but have rejected him, have missed opportunities to share his name with others, and have gone in opposite directions. Yet he didn't reject you, and he didn't reject me. No, instead, because of his incredible grace, he was rejected on our behalf. He took on those failures he took on those flaws and impurities and imperfections and was rejected by the wrath of God for you and for me so that we would always and forevermore be claimed as his own, called his children, gathered close on this day and always. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as ones that have been called to the Good Shepherd by his grace, as members of the flock, you too have been called and sent out to be ministers of the gospel, to be the present-day apostles and evangelists, to be the prophets that are mouthpieces for the Lord. So what's going to happen next? The answer is this, great things. They went out and preached that people should repent, and they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Spoiler alert. What's going to happen as you and I go out and faithfully proclaim the gospel that has been given to us? People are going to be saved. And that's a risk worth taking. Because eternities are going to be changed. Because salvation is going to be won. Because souls will be made alive through the gospel that you have in your heart and in your mouths to be shared. That changes lives both now and forevermore. As you share that message, many will deny it. Hundreds, if not thousands of people will laugh in your face and will laugh right at you because of what you share with them. But if you do that year in and year out, over and over again, and only one is brought to faith, it's all worth it. If their one singular eternity is changed because of what you shared with them, it was all worth the risk. It was all worth the possibility of rejection. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus saves people by using people like you, not others. You, in this moment in time, have been called by God to go and to tell and to trust that he will provide. 
your brothers and sisters in Christ, that will be enough. Because you have at your disposal the only message that can save. It's the message that saved you. It's the message that's forgiven you. And it's the message that can save and will save others. Go out in boldness and tell. Go out in boldness knowing that you have authority over impure spirits that answer to the name of the Lord and run away in fear. Because he is the victor over all things. Because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because he is your God both now and forevermore. Trust in him. Rely on him. And go out for him. Willing to be rejected. Go out and tell. And he will take care of the rest. This day and always. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of Christ, which is beyond understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Amen.